Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been as involved in gaming, let's call it gambling. You, you're in gaming, I'm in gambling. Uh, the uh, gambling industry for 30 years, I've worked in Nevada as a regulator, worked in Australia, and uh, worked around the world as a gaming lawyer. When we talk about gaming regulation, what do we mean? Uh, I mean, I can stand up here all day long and talk about Reg 16 in Nevada, which regulates public companies, and Reg 15, which regulates private companies, but I think everyone would head for the door and uh, kind of boring stuff. So, so let's talk about what, what gaming regulation is, and what I want to try to do is, is walk everybody through a, a casino in, in Las Vegas. I'm sure everybody's been to Las Vegas and uh, been into a casino, or most everybody has. So as soon as you walk into that casino, you are walking into a completely regulated environment from top to bottom, okay? The machine that you'll sit down at, the, the gambling device, what did it take to get that device there? Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to get that single device on that gambling floor. The company that produces it, the officers, the directors, the company itself, how is it started, source of money for the uh, investment, they're going all the way back to day one, follow the money. And, and is this company suitable to be licensed in the state of Nevada? And once, once you get through that process, you then have to go through all the technical standards uh, and all the code and the RNGs, uh, GLI, BMM, and then the Nevada Gaming Lab. And that's thousands and thousands of dollars to get that device approved, okay? But what the regulators in Nevada want, what the casino operators want, is they want happy people. Okay, and when you sit down at that device, you know for a fact that it's not rigged, it's not gaffed, but it's been tested and retested and tested. And you're going to sit down, and you don't have to worry about your money being taken and, and not uh, and and being cheated out of it. And and so let's walk around the casino and, and think about that. So that's just the gaming device. Let's talk about uh, like the 21 table you're playing car, uh, cards at. Well, that dealer that uh, is dealing to you, that dealer has a sheriff's card. That dealer has been backgrounded completely. Um, and many times the dealers don't get through that process. And why? Because maybe they have something in their background, an arrest or a conviction for theft. Theft is huge uh, in the gaming industry when you're dealing in a cash business. Uh, they, we can do it, deal with the DUIs, no big deal. But when it comes to theft and money issues, the Nevada Gaming Control Board is going to object to those work cards, and we try to help people get through the process. Many times it's just people forgetting about, well, uh, I forgot to tell the regulators that I was arrested, that I was stuffed and cuffed. Well, how does anybody forget about being arrested and, and handcuffed? Well, I guess some people do, but anyway. Uh, and so a lot of times it's just being, you know, your candor and, and transparency. And so it's the dealer, it's just the pit boss. It's the roulette wheels. Believe it or not, a roulette wheel in the state of Nevada is a gambling device. It has to go through all the technical testing. They want that completely random. You see people in the movie sitting there with their notes and saying, oh, I think the ball's going to drop there every so often. It shouldn't be. It should be completely uh, random. Now let's talk, so that's the environment. Well, let's talk about the internal control systems that go along. More regulation, more regulation. When you sit down at that gam gambling device and you pull that handle and you win a million dollars, is there a doubt in anyone's mind here that that money is not gonna be paid? And the reason is, is you've got internal control standards and you've got liquidity requirements that require those casinos to have enough bankroll to pay you, okay? And then let's say, let's take it a step further. You think you've won that million dollars, and that two sevens comes up, and that third seven, uh, it's halfway there, and you're like, oh, I won a million dollars, and the machine's going off, but the casino states, eh, you know, we've got an issue here. We've got a dispute. How do we resolve that dispute? We're not calling an 800 number uh, to someone in China, okay? We're, we're getting the Nevada Gaming Control Board involved. They'll be on, they'll come. And, and so the casino will work with the Nevada Gaming Control Board, they'll look at the cameras, and they'll decide whether they're gonna pay that jackpot. And believe me, uh, you know, everyone here is, well, you know, they don't wanna pay it. Oh, the casinos love to pay these. They've got the money, it's free publicity. They love to pay the big jackpots. But if state law is not going to allow that because of that, that, um, that device that maybe was, you know, a malfunction. Uh, if you will. Also, uh, many times uh, it's happened in the past, you read in the newspapers where uh, dad hits the big jackpot, it's multi-million, but he's sitting there with his son and the son actually pulled the handle. And the cameras are gonna show that the son pulled the handle and not gonna get the jackpot. And so it's, it's a, 
completely reviewed um, that environment. Absolutely uh, uh, right down, and, and, and regulation in this case is good. You're dealing with people's money, OPM. But as I said, what the, the, at least in Las Vegas, the regulators in the state want you to be very, very happy. They want you to get on that plane and they want you to go home and tell everyone about what a great place Vegas is. That's why I think Las Vegas today is one of the top visited places in the world. I've lived there on and off since 1983. I have no idea why people come to Vegas because even for me to go to the Strip, it's painful. But, um, but people, uh, they come and they love it. So that's, uh, that's good for all of us. And, and, and let's talk about the online. Game, uh, Nevada now has online gaming. The same sort of review. The, the technical standards and what are the technical standards. Uh, uh, are you within the state of Nevada, the geolocation, the air age verification, the liquidity requirements, all of the same thing except it's, a, it's an online casino, okay? The entry into the gaming industry, it's a privilege, it's not a right. You, you go down and get your driver's license, anybody can do that. Um, the, uh, the gaming industry doesn't have to allow you in. Uh, today, let's go big picture. Let's talk about today. Uh, th over 300 jurisdictions regulate gaming in this country. Over 300, okay? There's, in the state of California here alone, we have over 60 tribal gaming agencies at the tribal gaming casinos. Each casino has its own gaming regulatory body and a compact with the state. They are the primary regulatory body. Those tr tribal gaming agencies work with the state, the Bureau of Gambling Control, the Department of Justice. The uh, National Indian Gaming Commission is also involved with the tribes because they come in and, and review uh, management contracts. When I was with the Nevada Gaming Control Board starting in 1983, there were three jurisdictions basically out there. Nevada, New Jersey, and Mississippi. Today, over 300. What has that done to this industry? What are the challenges? You can imagine a lot of these jurisdictions like Missouri, for example. I don't want to pick on Missouri, but one day they have gaming. And the, the big joke, uh, probably people kid about it today still, was the troopers who wear the hats and who were measuring skid marks the day before are now doing complicated financial investigations. It's very in the learning curve. It's very difficult. We're going to send some people to a class for two or three days, and they're going to learn what a balance sheet is and expect to be able to do a sophisticated gaming jurisdiction. Good luck. I, uh, I know when I started with the board, I had my master's degree. I went to the police academy. That was required, and I was the best thing since sliced bread. But the institutional knowledge in our Las Vegas office, the, uh, the, one of the individuals who was teaching me, Gary Gleason, a former Navy SEAL, uh, an intense guy. I had San Diego PD and LA PD and the financial people, and every day they were just beating the hell out of you, and you were doing these investigations, and, and I finally, my big first investigation was Wayne Newton. But that was, you were, it was there, it was every day. And so I was lucky, but I, I look at these new jurisdictions today that are emerging, and, and suddenly they turn on the lights and they want to regulate gaming and they hand you an application. I feel sorry for the applicants in many of these jurisdictions because it's very, very difficult to, to impress upon the regulators. And, and having been in it for 30 years, you try to give them some advice. Well, you know, maybe you don't need to do this or maybe your focus should be here. But, of course, they don't want to hear that. Um, and so it's a, it's a difficult process. Let's talk about multinational investigations. I've, I've spent uh, uh, time in uh, Australia and Japan and all over the world doing investigations. And, and so now we're talking about, say, we've, we, some of these new jurisdictions are trying to regulate the multinationals where we have language differences and we have cultural differences and we have accounting systems and different tax systems. And, and it's very, very difficult. Um, one example, uh, we were doing an uh, investigation and we had a, a gentleman out of Australia who had about 15 book-making arrests, okay? Well, in Australia, that was like a speeding ticket, you know, 25 bucks and no big deal. Book-making here, we're thinking of the New York mob and, 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 and terrible things. We actually got them licensed in, uh, in Nevada, but only because of the culture and the, and the differences and, uh, and, and the getting the regulators to understand that, and that was Nevada. I can't promise that would... Uh, that would happen in other areas. And so it's a very, very difficult, you know, with, as I said, with all the different uh, jurisdictions. The regulatory process, as I said, it's not perfect, a, a ton of duplication. I mean, if you're a gaming manufacturer and you're licensed in 200 plus jurisdictions, how many times can you be fingerprinted? And that's one of my, you know, we were just through the process, say, in Nevada and Missouri and Indiana and Illinois and Iowa and Louisiana wants a new set of fingerprints. And I say, call, call Nevada. We just did it. Oh, no, no, no. They've got to be on our fingerprint cards. And so, you know, there's a lot of things like that, a lot of frustration, but you, 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 you know, you deal with it. Um, 
uh, a lot of times, you know, who has to file? Again, Nevada, it's pretty streamlined. They look at it from who can influence and control the operation. They see EO, the COO, the CFO, uh, who's in charge of the audit committee if it's a public company. But a lot of these jurisdictions, not like Nevada, the smaller jurisdictions like New Jersey, pick on New Jersey, they don't have a lot of casinos to regulate. So they sit around and think of, well, who, uh, who, who else can we have file? And then on top of that, a lot of these jurisdictions, every two years you're filing applications, okay? So if you're a gaming manufacturer like a Konami or an IGT or a Bally, and you're licensed in 200 plus jurisdictions, and then you're having to file applications every two years and regurgitate the same information, uh, many of these companies have employees who spend, they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars just making sure that applications are, are, are correct. Um, as a lawyer working in these jurisdictions in the, in the gambling area, it's, it's really imperative to understand the, the personality of each jurisdiction and the structure of each jurisdiction. What makes that jurisdiction tick? What, who are the regulators? What type of investigations do they do? Do, are they, do they come from a cop background and, and a cop mentality, meaning a, a Scribner's error or a mistake on, a, on an application is just, oh my God, that's the worst thing? Or do they more, more sophisticated? Uh, is there you know, the checks and balances? Uh, Nevada Gaming Control Board, give you an example. Three member board, a recommending body, five member commission that makes that decision. You've got a checks and balances. I've had regulators in, in certain jurisdictions um, and I just tell you straight up, they've told me, John, I'm God. <laughs> I'm God. Stops right here. Very, very dangerous, uh, that sort of structure, the corruption that's possible and everything else. So it's, uh, you want to look at that, that checks and balances system and, and, and what sort of jurisdiction you're working in. It's imperative to understand the regulators. A lot of these jurisdictions, uh, like Nevada, they have a dedicated and I'll get to sp specifics on Nevada in, in just a few minutes, but they have a, you know, a focused Nevada Gaming Control Board and agents. A lot of these agencies, they don't have the, the infrastructure, they don't have the, the, the talent, they don't have the, uh, uh, the expense side to, um, to do these sophisticated jurisdictions. So I call them armchair regulators, and I wrote a law review article on it um, some time ago. But, but these are really dangerous jurisdictions because what they're doing is they're picking up everything on the internet. And we know everything on the internet's accurate, right? Boy, that's, that must be true. And so if you're dealing with an armchair regulator and you know there's information on the internet about your applicant, you might want to get with that armchair regulator and say, listen, this is what you're going to find but, and develop a white paper, but here's why that information's not accurate. Because otherwise you're going to have problems. You're swimming up stream. It's like swimming from Alcatraz to uh, the Marine, Marine Memorial Club and you miss that entrance and then you go out towards the Golden Gate and you're trying to swim against that three or four knot current. You're not going to do it. Uh, you'll end up out underneath the Golden Gate. So it's, uh, it's really imperative again to understand the types of, of people that you're dealing with and the, the nuances. The, uh, here in California, the uh, California Gambling Control Commission, the chairman, Rick Lopes, really, really good guy. Uh, and he was with the Bureau of Gambling Control for many years and, uh, and the Department of Justice. And as he said to me, with a lot of these, these investigations, you know, the police mentality versus the regulatory investigation, he said, well, John, you know, we send people to the uh, police academy and, and then they're on SWAT teams and they're used to kicking in doors. And then we, we take that hat off and we put this regulatory hat off on and they sit across from people and they're supposed to believe them. Yeah, okay, I believe everything you say. That's not, that's not the mindset. And so a lot of these jurisdictions, it's very difficult to go from that police mentality to conducting a regulatory investigation. A good example, uh, the police mentality, uh, going through an investigation, uh, they do some review with a law enforcement agency, there's some information in, uh, in a file, an intelligence file, and it says, well, this person did something 15 years ago. The cop mentality, we, we better be careful here, better watch this. The regulator had is going to say, well, hmm, you know, was there an arrest? Was there a conviction? Uh, probably nothing we really need to worry about. And, uh, and, and that's, that's, the, uh, uh, that's the difference. The other thing with the gaming jurisdictions and the personality, are, is, are they doing it part time? A lot of these jurisdictions, uh, uh, many app, Minnesota regulators, for example, they're doing the gaming part time and then they get a call and they're out doing a homicide investigation. Again, you're not getting their full time and attention to this, and so it's, it's frustrating. They, they start this investigation, and then they stop it. Then they start it, and then they stop it. And a lot of these jurisdictions where it's part-time, they don't have the transactional waiver. And the transactional waiver is uh, where 
you fill out your application and, and your application's complete, okay? And then they'll allow you to start transacting business. Other jurisdictions like Nevada, no, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna do the complete investigation and see if you're suitable. So um, that's kind of an overview, big picture. I, we could talk uh, for a week on this. It would be fun, but uh, we've got, I think, uh, 15 minutes to go. Oh, we've only got five to go. Oh, okay, let me get through this quickly. Um, the, where did it all start? The Nevada Gaming Control Board started as a taxing agency, and then they found out very quickly they, they weren't getting the tax dollars they should have been getting because the mob. The mob was involved with a lot of the casinos. There was an article uh, in the RJ Review Journal the other day from John Smith, and the, the headline was, Death of Mob Boss Finally Cuts Vegas Ties, the Motor City Mafia. And the, uh, at the time, it was the Edgewater Casino and, and Laughlin, small casino, and they estimated, the FBI estimated they'd taken $10 million out of that, that casino. Nevada had to grow up fast. They had to grow up faster. The feds were going to shut them down. Okay, and so Nevada did not suddenly say, we want to be the best. They did it, and they had their backsides handed to them many times. Okay, and so it's, uh, Nevada, it's a very straightforward uh, process. It's smash mouth football. You know where they're coming at you. They're going to do a complete financial review and background review. It's important to understand. So the social gaming, let's talk about that very, very quickly. Where does social gaming fit in here? When I, I will tell you one, there's a common denominator between social gaming and gambling. Both want your credit card. Both want your credit card numbers, okay? We talked about Nevada-style review and those casinos, okay? You have complete regulation. Now, when I have a player dispute, I know it's going to be resolved. Who am I going to, if I'm, uh, for example, in social gaming, do I know the code has been reviewed by GLI or by the Nevada Gaming Lab? Are, are companies having code reviewed or not reviewed? How do I know that code's that I'm not getting cheated when I give my credit card number to somebody? How do I know it's not going to be floating around? How do I know I'm not getting, uh, you know, that, that uh, I don't have that comfort level, I don't think, as I would in a uh, Nevada casino. Organized crime. Is your industry multi-billion dollar industry? Is it attractive to organized crime? Probably. How do you know? How do you know? Do any companies here, background employees, do they have compliance reviews? Do you know your vendors, do you know your employees? Do you know your code? Do you know the games that you're putting out there? Do you know if, if an employee of yours is gaffed maybe or, or put in some code and, and uh, to make the game, um, you know, uh, where it's, it's not, you know, you're doing OPM, other people's money, where, uh, again, you're, uh, you're doing no favor to the, to the customer. So it doesn't make sense to, to make the, the, the social gaming area more transparent. Maybe, uh, you know, are the feds going to come in? Are the states going to come in? I don't know. I don't know. But is it, is it, does it make sense to make yourself more attractive, maybe develop a compliance committee, a compliance plan? So say in the gambling side where I come from, some of those big companies and those manufacturers, and they see your social gaming, and they say, wow, we really like that company, but, you know, they're a associated with so-and-so and we can't touch them because our compliance review won't let us uh, associate with them. And if we associate with them, then we may lose our gambling license, okay? On the other hand, if you're backgrounding your employees and you're, you're doing all of that review and you know who your vendors are and you're getting your code reviewed by GLI and approved, then suddenly that gambling company is saying, wow, this is, this is a pretty good company. This is, this is really attractive to us, okay? And so, uh, again, I don't... I, I don't get on and play the social games. I'm one of those, the, the older folks. I, um, but uh, I have kids, I call them kids who work for me. And so before I came up here and to San Francisco and started talking, I said, tell me about social gaming. Tell me what it's about. Tell me what you do online and what you play. And, and do you ever feel like you've been, you haven't had a, a good experience? Or, or if you had a player dispute, did you call an 800 number in China? Or did someone say to you, no, hey, hey, let's get this handled. We have a, some sort of a, a dispute resolution to take care of those issues, OK? So that's, I'm out of time. Questions? Anybody, any questions? I, I have a question. Why did, would the Nevada Gaming Control Board regulate Wayne Newton? Wayne was going to, uh, he was uh, purchasing a casino, oh, the okay. Aladdin. Did he pass? The Aladdin. Uh, actually, uh, he backed out. The, the problem was the Teamsters and the organized crime that was funding it. With Wayne Newton? No, uh, oh. the, uh, the financing side. So, But Wayne was good. Wayne's a good guy. Any questions, anyone? I, I have another question since I get, you know, you're like 600 bucks an hour, so I might as well ask as many <laughs> free questions as I can. Um, so talk a little bit about GLI and certification. And I don't know if anybody knows what GLI is. It's a, it's a licensing company that basically vets your uh, physical gambling machine, like a, a machine which are called cabinets on the floor of a casino. And GLI basically says, this is a machine that operates fairly, and then you can rely on it, right? And in fact, I will tell you the... Uh, How much does that 
cost a particular operator or a, a company like Ballet to get their, that machine vetted? Well, a lot of them, they're just hybrids of that original machine, and so maybe you're getting your RNG, the code is the same, but you're just adding gaming, new games to it, and so they're checking those games and how they're interfacing uh, with the system. But, but it's expensive. Listen, James Meta runs a great company. He's the owner of GLI, okay? But, but it's expensive, and I'll tell you what, from the initial, it's thousands of dollars. How many thousand? 10,000? Or more. Yeah. 50,000? No. It's, it's expensive. How much? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, um, I have clients who, who pay the bills. I don't actually see those bills, but I know they grumble a lot. Does, would, it, would it be worth anybody here who's a social game developer to have their game vetted by GLI or B, BMM? A BMM. BMM. Would it, would it be worth their going to that expense to have that machine vetted, do you think? Oh, I think absolutely. Again, Why? I, I, well, you're... As I said a minute ago, you're dealing with other people's money, right? There's, there's two common denominators in the gambling world and the social gaming world. That's I want your credit card. And we get calls all the time on that, for example, where people, well, we want to get around the gambling, so we've got the three prongs, and, and you know, are we, is there consideration, and is there chance, and is there a prize? And if we've got all three, we've got gambling. And so people are trying to get around that. And what we're always you know, talking about is we're writing opinions on that, but we're always suggesting that you get your system vetted. Okay, uh, G a GLI certificate, there's nothing but upside. And if your company can't afford it, 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 it provides that, that protection. A against even plaintiff's lawyers today, where they're coming in and suing people, and the, the better you can do and the more infrastructure you can create from a regulatory point of view, the better off you are. So you're proactive and, and, and doing that. And I also think you're making yourself very attractive to the, to the gambling world, okay? That, that now you're, you mean you understand regulation and compliance and technical standards. And if the gambling world wants to use some of the social gaming type themes, then that's a, that's a great step. I, I'm only aware of one game uh, that's been vetted, and that's Fresh Deck Poker from Idle Games that has a GLI certification. And Melissa, anybody know of any other games? There's a company that, uh, that's in the room next door, a company called Gamblit, G-A-M-B-L-I-T. They were just licensed by the Nevada Gaming Commission. One of the, and, and they have what they're, a Gamblify, where they've got a, uh, a social or a, uh, you know, entertainment game that uh, uh, goes along with a, a, a gambling experience, Gamblifying uh, this. And uh, it's, a, it's a great company. They went through that process. They paid a lot of money for it. But... Um, they're uh, you know, very attractive too now. And in fact, I would tell you, because of what they do, they incorporate a lot of the social gaming. I was told you know, a lot of your major companies, your manufacturers, your IGTs and others are very concerned about this company because the age today that's very interested in this, the older, who's playing slot machines in Vegas? It's the 50-year-old a female who's going to sit there all day and smoke and drink, okay? That's, that's really, that's the, but, but what they're trying to capture is that 20 to 40 group that does not sit at those slot machines, they'd rather go out to the pool. And so they're creating these games, these entertainment games, and they're the first company to do it. And I will tell you, there's concern out there by the big dogs that this company is going to take a lot of their floor space, okay? And it has a lot to do. I mean, this company's here at your conference. Okay. Any, any other questions? Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you.